Uh, I'll start perhaps with what is Jewish Malayalam. Uh, well, before that, what are we going to do today? What is Malayalam? That would be the next uh, topic to cover. Uh, then we're, I'm going to talk about uh, Hebrew in Malabar, Southwest India, between the 9th and the 15th centuries. Uh, I'm then going to talk a little bit about Jewish communities between the 1500s and the 1950s, uh, the names of the language, uh, Jewish and Muslim Malayalam, and there will be a few slides about the features, archaic features, migrated regionalism and Hebrew component. And finally, we will uh, have a look at uh, Jewish Malayalam literature in a glance and also think a little bit about the contemporary status uh, more broadly of the heritage of this community. So what is Malayalam? Uh, I hope you can see the map. Um, maybe you can uh, minimize the images of our faces. So Malayalam is a Dravidian language. It belongs to the Tamil Malayalam uh, South Dravidian one branch. Uh, and the other Dravidian languages, uh, the big Dravidian languages are Tamil, Kannada, and Telugu, besides Malayalam, that are spoken predominantly in Southern India. We do have, as you can see on this map, some pockets of Dravidian languages like Brahui in the uh, north, in actually in what is uh, currently Pakistan, and also uh, in the northwest of India, in uh, Bengal and Bangladesh, Malto and Kuruch. So, but otherwise, and of course Sri Lanka, because of the Tamilians, uh, Tamilian population in Sri Lanka, they have already their own uh, Jaffna uh, Tamil. Uh, but basically this uh, language family is more or less confined to Southern India. And Malayalam is spoken in that uh, region on the West Coast, uh, near the southernmost part uh, of the West Coast. And more or less now, this is the same kind of borders of the modern state of Kerala. And it is indeed the Kerala state official language. You can see on the north also two smaller languages, Tulu and Cordova. I'm going to mention Tulu uh, slightly later. So this is where uh, currently Malayalam is spoken. And uh, in its history, it evolved out of a West Coast Middle Tamil dialect. Uh, the Malayalam records go back as far as the 800s, Common Era, and this is one of them that we are also going to explore a little bit. Um, and it currently has more or less 40 million speakers, predominantly in Kerala, in the modern state of Kerala, but there are also Malayali diaspora elsewhere, in the US, of course, and in the Gulf countries and in Europe. Okay. So I would like also to say a few words about Malayalam language varieties. So again, we have to look at this map and now at the other side of the map, the North Indian languages, uh, Indo-Aryan languages as they are uh, better known, sometimes also called Indo-European languages because those North Indian languages uh, have in their proto-history uh, affiliation also to European languages, including English. Uh, so Malayalam and other Dravidian languages were in contact uh, with those Indo-Aryan languages for over three, four millennia ever, even. Um, and most in, in the beginning, like there are several phases of contacts that influence the Dravidian languages, especially in the lexicon. Uh, where you have Pali carried on southwards from the northern parts of India uh, by Buddhists, uh, Prakrit uh, by Jains, and later on around the seventh and eighth centuries, the Brahminic migrations, Brahminic Hinduism brings uh, Sanskrit into uh, the linguistic landscape. And this is an important point because it helps us to identify periods uh, in Malayalam uh, linguistic uh, evolution. And then we have Dravidian hybrid dialects. I already said I'm going to mention Tulu again. So if you again look at that part of the uh, west coast of South India, uh, you can see that 
the Malayalam, right, the Malayalam speaking region borders with the Tamil speaking region, right? So in the border lines, in the border regions, uh, there are those Tamil Malayalam language hybrids, whereas at the north, you have Tulu and Kodava language hybrids, mainly Tulu, but sometimes also Kodava uh, influences the Malayalam speech. And this is important because, as you will shortly see, uh, Jewish contacts in the region uh, were very strong in that area, and that is visible in uh, Jewish Malayalam. And religious, I guess you already encountered this lovely term. Uh, so we have in Kerala Arabic Malayalam, and Arabic Malayalam is uh, written in the Arabic script, as you can see here. If anybody here can read Arabic, maybe you can see, you know, the first word there is Ishal. It's not Arabic. Uh, it is actually a Malayalam Tamil word, Ishal. So Arabic Malayalam is written in the Arabic script and the earliest compositions uh, that we know of are from the early 17th century. We have also Syriac Malayalam associated, of course, with the Christian communities of the region. This is a page from a manuscript uh, that my colleague Istvan Perzel collected in Kerala. Uh, and this is the Syriac script uh, that just like Arabic Malayalam, they use those Semitic scripts, uh, playing with the letters, with the dots, with the directions in different way to represent the Malayalam language. So again, Syriac script predominantly with some letters uh, adjusted to Malayalam. Syriac Malayalam, uh, the earliest documents are from late 17th, uh, early 18th century. And Jewish Malayalam, so that's the religious lect we are going to talk about. Jewish Malayalam was not written in the Hebrew script, as you can see here. This is an example of a song notebook from Kochi. It was written in the Malayalam script. But here's an interesting thing. Because once you start looking into the songs that were transmitted in those notebooks, it's pretty clear that the oldest layers of this literature is from the 15th century. So even though Jewish Malayalam is not written in the Hebrew script, in fact, the literature in Jewish Malayalam predates both Arabic Malayalam and Syriac Malayalam by uh, two, three centuries. And this is a, a, a very interesting thing that needs to be uh, explored. Okay. Uh, so, we need to talk a little bit about Jewish history in Kerala. Uh, Jewish history in Kerala is inseparable from Indian Ocean trade routes between uh, the 800s and the 1500s. Uh, this is a map of the trade routes and the contacts uh, of Jews with the southern uh, southwestern coast of uh, India uh, probably started in Persia. And you can see on this map, right, the trade routes uh, of the Indian Ocean. What you can't see on this map is that actually there are also land routes that Jews uh, traveled and also others, not only Jews, of course, uh, West Asians, you can say. And those trade routes are also connected to the Mediterranean. So basically those uh, maritime routes that are depicted on this map are actually much more, uh, they go far beyond uh, the Indian Ocean trade routes. So we have the Persian Gulf that has evidence for uh, contacts of seafaring trading communities uh, and Jews specifically. And we have the, uh, the Gulf of Aden and especially the port town of Aden that uh, provides a lot of uh, documents and records uh, of Jewish contacts with the Malabar coast. So this is important to keep in mind that this is the context of trade. And let us see the evidence of linguistic contact. So the earliest evidence is the column copper plates from 849 that you already encountered in Old Malayalam. And this copper plate inscription, it's a trade agreement, yeah? Uh, but this copper plate inscription is also uh, the second earliest inscription in Old Malayalam. So we are talking about the period in which the Malabar coast emerges as a, a region uh, with its own political identity. And it looks like the West Asian traders uh, contributed significantly. So the fourth, uh, sorry, the sixth plate of this inscription has names in, as you can see on the left, 
Kufic Arabic, very nicely engraved. Uh, below that, there, are, there is a list of names in Pahlavi of Zoroastrians and Christians. Uh, we know it by the, their names, and the Zoroastrians also mentioned that they are of the good religion. And below the Pahlavi, as you can see, I hope we have uh, the Hebrew script. Uh, what is there in the Hebrew script are four names in Judeo-Persian. They are written in Judeo-Persian because it's not only the name, but also a kind of a formula, Hamgun man farish guhum, I am a, a, a witness of. And who are those uh, four Jews? The first is Hassan Ali. And it's a very interesting uh, name because it seems that this trader uh, established a network that later on emerges also in Aden 200 years later. Uh, we know that because uh, Jews used to give, you probably know that Jews used to give to their uh, grandchildren, uh, sorry, to their children, their male children, the names of their grandfathers. So we have Hassan and Ali repeated also in later records uh, of trade in Yemen. Uh, and then we have another interesting name, it's Haksmail. Uh, notice this uh, Ismail is, of course, uh, derived from Ishmael. So we had uh, Jews called by uh, a name that would, we would associate uh, with Muslims, but this practice is recorded elsewhere. There are Jews and rabbis called Ishmael also uh, elsewhere in the Jewish diaspora. And then we have Avraham Kuami, probably from the city of Qom in Persia. And finally, a person called Zikri Ikhye, that perhaps he too uh, was uh, later on, uh, his descendants uh, probably continued this India trade uh, uh, further beyond. And he must have been an Arabic speaker. I say that because his, the way his name is, is spelled is more in line with how Arabs spell the name Yehye. Okay, so, the next phase of contacts, uh, there is a little bit of silence in the records, but then we have the Cairo Geniza records uh, between the 11th and the 13th centuries. Okay, so you'll probably hear more about these records uh, later on. Uh, the Geniza records uh, are um, the, the Cairo Geniza, okay? The Cairo Geniza is a chamber, you know what the Geniza is, right? Where all where well, Jews always shovel their manuscripts in the Hebrew script that you are not supposed to throw away, right? Because it's a sacred language. So every synagogue has this chamber called Geniza and every once in a while somebody comes and remove the manuscripts and bury them with a special prayer. But in Cairo, the, the synagogue, by the way, that Maimonides uh, was praying in and his family, they were too lazy to do that for 1,000 years. So you can imagine that in the late 16th, 19th century, when uh, travelers and scholars uh, realized what is hidden there, <laughs> it was a great discovery. So among the, the huge amounts of records are there, like old Bibles or old you know, liturgical poetries and texts that were lost to the Jewish world and found, you know, rediscovered in the Cairo Geniza. There are also a lot of daily documents, daily life documents, like divorce documents, legal documents, et cetera, et cetera. So within this huge Cairo Geniza, they also found uh, Judeo-Arabic uh, letters exchanged between India traders that lived in the Mediterranean, in Egypt, in Aden, and in the Malabar coast. And the India trade records in the Geniza are limited to the 11th until the 13th century. So what do we have there are business and personal letters, uh, predominantly in Judeo-Arabic. Uh, you can read about it on, it's called the India book uh, by Shlomo Dov Goitain and Mordechai Akiva Friedman, a very impressive work that is trying to reconstruct the lives of those India traders. And uh, in those records, we can see Arab, Persian, and their Jewish partners, okay? So this was a very tolerant and even liberal uh, atmosphere of uh, exchange and contacts and partnerships. And it is of course reflected in a lot of uh, Arab and Persian documents from uh, that period. For example, this 
example is this wonderful book uh, called Makamat al-Hariri, an adventure of travelers uh, from the I think 12th or 13th centuries, uh, in which you have this lovely image of an Indian Ocean ship. And we can imagine, right, that the travelers at that time uh, that probably looked like that. We know also from the documents that the, this image is, is a nice reflection uh, of what we see in the document, documents where on the dock, the, the navigator and the sailors and the seafarers are Indians and Africans. You can see even a small Shiva temple on the dock. And below the dock, there are the Persian and Arab traders, and probably among them, there were quite a few Jews. So uh, what we have, uh, which is important in those records, uh, is that you can see the uh, intensified contacts between Malayalam and Judeo-Arabic. And there are quite a few Malayalam words in uh, those records. Also important is that we have evidence in those records uh, of intermarriages between Jewish traders and local women. And you have to understand that the way this international trade worked in that period is uh, alliances between uh, West Asian traders, the Muslims and others coming from patrilineal uh, societies and the coastal communities of the Indian Oceans as far as Indonesia and also in Africa were matrilineal. So it was a nice kind of combination in which a trader that comes and goes could have a family in the region and be a part of a household and have kinship networks within the region because that helped them secure bilingual children which were uh, indispensable in uh, conducting the trade business and the networks. And this practice is also um, uh, attested to in uh, later records from the Portuguese and the Dutch who encouraged their sailors to do what the Muslim do and marry local women in order to have bilingual children. And of course, for Jews, this is a little bit of uh, something that we don't really want to acknowledge. <laughs> but in the Geniza records uh, from all over the Mediterranean, we have a lot of uh, material. Uh, there was a recent uh, a PhD published only on that about concubinage and conversions, uh, etc., in the Jewish world related to such uh, intermarriages. And we have evidence for that in this lovely document sent from uh, Aden to the Malabar coast, in which uh, a name uh, is mentioned of one of the trading partners, Ishak Elbanyan. Uh, we can translate it as Isaac the Banya, and Banya is an Indian merchant. So we have a Semitic name, probably a Muslim, because if, it, if he were a Jew, probably they would have, would have written his name Itzhak and not Ishak. Uh, but still, uh, Ishak al Banyan is either a Muslim or a Christian or a Jew who is already belonging to a Banyan uh, group, uh, probably an extended family. Okay. And those Jewish networks of the Malabar coast, at some point, uh, we start in Kolam in the uh, 849, we proceed to that uh, northern regions of the Malabar coast where we have uh, port towns mentioned in the Geniza records. Probably there was a Jewish community there for three or four centuries in that northern region near Kasargod. Uh, Mangalore, which is in modern uh, day Karnataka is also amply mentioned in the Geniza records. And finally, towards the mid uh, 14th century, uh, we see uh, evidence of Jews clustering in central Kerala in that uh, uh, district that is called Ernagulam on the island of Kuchi. What do we have there? And here, this is the period where you can start talking about settled Jewish communities. So the earliest uh, inscriptional evidence uh, record from the region is this tombstone from a place called Chena Mangalam, not very far from Arnagulam, but deeper into the land, where a woman called Sarah Bat Israel is buried in 1269. To bury a woman, probably a matriarch, probably a convert to judge by her, by her name, the, the, the family members need to conduct Jewish rituals, right? We need to have a scribe who is, is able to inscribe the incise, the Hebrew characters on uh, the granite stone. 
Uh, and indeed, there is a community in Chenamangalam uh, later on. And even more strikingly is this synagogue inscription from Kochi, uh, dated 1344, Anno Mundi. And this is really important. The Chenamangalam tombstone and also later inscriptions, Hebrew inscriptions from the region, are according to Seleucid era, which was the, the practice in, uh, in uh, uh, among Asian Jewish communities. In the mid 14th century, it is only European Jews who used Anumundi. So we can assume that actually it may have been a Mediterranean Jew from the northern parts of the Mediterranean, maybe Italy, maybe the Iberian Peninsula, um, who uh, aligned with local Jews in order to build this uh, synagogue. And by the way, this synagogue is the earliest community recorded in Kochi. So it's most probable that uh, the Jews of this synagogue basically established this uh, very important port town. There was nothing there before 1341. Uh, and this is the synagogue that was constructed. Uh, the structure itself is from the mid 16th century, Kadahumbagam Synagogue in Kochi. But this inscription was found up there in the attic, probably because they uh, enlarged the synagogue, renovated it, and they put the inscription uh, in the attic because, of course, it's a sacred script. Nobody is going to throw it away. Okay. So what do we have between the 1500s and the 1900s? Uh, this is when we see uh, eight synagogue communities, three in Kuchi, two in Arnagulam, one in Chenamangalam, one in Parur, and one in Mala. And uh, in the mid 20th century, we have approximately 3000 speakers. The number sometimes varies, sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more. Uh, and the, most of them migrated en masse uh, to Israel in uh, the years between 1949 and 1957, not without uh, lots of hurdles. And I got to say that these communities organized and sold the synagogue property, which is landed property, in order to fund collectively the migrations of uh, the synagogue congregations, the synagogue communities. Uh, however, there were some families left behind who didn't want to leave Kerala. Uh, and also among them, there was a second, let's say, wave of migrations in the 1970s. So for example, this is an image of one of the families left behind in, uh, or cluster of families in Parur, uh, more or less in 1965. So what is there now in terms of Jewish Malayalam speech? Uh, we have basically more or less 100 speakers left in Israel. Uh, 70 years old would be the youngest. Most of them are much older. And we have a second generation of Jewish Malayalam speakers of about 50 years old, plus minus, uh, that can understand Malayalam, can speak Malayalam, which is inter, you know, kind of mixed with Hebrew and English, and the pronunciation is, is not great, uh, but still there are some people who can follow. And I got to say that those who are left behind um, and didn't migrate uh, in the 1950s, uh, their Malayalam is much closer to the standardized Malayalam or the dialects uh, of Arnagulam. So it are, these are those speakers in Israel that you can learn uh, what is Jewish Malayalam uh, uh, from. Okay, the name of the language. So in uh, the years between 2008 and 2009, I was living in this village, Mesilat after I spent a few years in Kerala and studied Malayalam. And that's basically where I realized that they have a Jewish dialect. Uh, and when I realized that, uh, I raised a little bit of funding for a language documentation project. And uh, when I talked with them about their language, they said that they call it Malabarit, which is the term Malabar plus the ending it. And this is very interesting because Malabar is precisely uh, the name of the region as it was known to uh, the Arabs, uh, Jewish and Muslim and, and Christian traders. The Arab and Persians used to call the area Malabar. Um, 
They also call it Cochinit because they like to associate themselves with the city of Cochi or Cochin as it is also known. Uh, so that's another term that you can find uh, in, the, in the way they refer to the language Cochinit. And you might ask, why don't they call it Malayalam? Of course, you cannot expect them to call it Jewish Malayalam, right? So why don't they call it Malayalam? Malayalam, the name of the language was coined only in the 19th century by a German missionary who wrote the dictionary of Malayalam and uh, worked on translations and uh, reading of uh, manuscripts and collecting manuscripts in Kerala. Uh, until then, uh, and even this is one of the terms that the Jews, uh, Jewish Malayalam speakers use to refer to their language, it, if they needed to refer to it as a, as a language, they might have uh, come up with the term Tamil, which is the classical language, the big language, uh, prestigious language of the East Coast. But actually, uh, they mostly refer to it as Pasha, their language. The Jews, when I asked them about their language, they used to tell me this is a paraya basha, old language, because Malayalis, even today, still refer to the language as their language, Pasha. That might seem odd, perhaps, but actually, we have to ask ourselves, when does a language uh, receive a name? That is actually the, the curious thing, because speakers normally don't come up with a special term for their language unless they have to. So think, for example, about the, the language of uh, the Malay uh, language of Indonesia. Indonesian is called Bahasa Indonesia. Why? It is derived from the same Sanskrit term, Bahasa, that was prevalent all across the Indian Ocean world. And all Indian languages, all the vernaculars uh, refer to themselves as Bahasha. There are just a few languages who uh, obtain this status of a, a language with its own name, like Sanskrit, Pali, the Buddhist Pali, or Tamil. Uh, and we can compare it to Hebrew. Think about it. When do we first hear the term Ivrit, right? This is a term that has been coined in the national, nationalist period, right? In the Zionist period, when you need a language for your territory or for your nation. Uh, I recently encountered the grammar book of Hebrew from Italy in the 19th century, where it's not written, this is the grammar of Ivrit, it is the grammar of Lashon HaKodesh. And Lashon, of course, is just like Pasha, it's the language, a grammar of the sacred language. Similarly, in Italy, uh, Latin was the important language, right? So Italians only for centuries, they referred to their vernaculars as vulgar. That was the name of Italian before uh, the national period. So just a little bit of uh, food for thought about this issue. Okay. And there was a question about which is the closest dialect. So it's not surprising, I guess, after you hear uh, of the history of trade, um, that the closest uh, Malayalam variety to Jewish Malayalam is Muslim Malayalam. In purpose, I do not say Arabic Malayalam, but Muslim Malayalam, because there is a difference between the Arabic Malayalam, which is transmitted and written as a literary language in the, sorry, Arabic script, and what the Muslims of Kerala uh, speak, which is very uh, close to Jewish Malayalam. And also, the, if you can look at those uh, images, right, you can see that there are also similarities in the way they're dressed, except that the Muslim women cover their heads, whereas the Jewish women didn't used to cover their heads. But the men definitely looked very similar, especially with the skull cap, with the topi. And let us taste a little bit, uh, uh, bits and pieces of the language itself. So the term in Jewish Malayalam for husband is mapila. I was really surprised to hear it. I couldn't even imagine because today in Kerala, mapila means indigenous Muslim and mopla in uh, British uh, uh, Indian. So later I learned that actually mapila was the term used to all those West Asian communities, Christian, uh, Jews and Muslims. Uh, but still, you notice that to say Mapila, uh, the caste name to 
to refer like that to a husband requires a little bit of reflection. Muslims, uh, for the sake of comparison, they also use the same term apila in the way they refer to a husband, pudi apila, um, which is husband in Muslim Malayalam, which is derived from pudia, new, and mapila, husband. So how come? And no other community, by the way, uses the term apila uh, for a husband. So how come? So again, we have to think about the history of Indian Ocean trade and intermarriages. And you might recall that I was talking about those matrilineal communities. So for matrilineal communities, the ideal husband is the maternal uncle's son. Maman is maternal uncle and Pila is son. And this is the origin of the term uh, Mapila. And the language, uh, the archaic features of the language, this is really useful in uh, constructing the history of this community. Uh, we have, again, similarities with Muslim Malayalam. We have the dative ending Ike. The dative en uh, ending Ike in uh, modern new Malayalam uh, actually is not used with words ending in an, male words ending in an like avan. So avan him with dative would be avan for him in standard Malayalam, actually since the the period of inscriptions, uh, you can see this change taking place. And more or less around the 13th century, uh, Avanike is replaced by Avane, but not in Muslim Malayalam and in Jewish Malayalam. And again, in very old Malayalam inscriptions, you will see Avanike. Uh, so these the two uh, religion acts retain this very old form, which does sound like Tamil, and perhaps this is one of the reasons why they say that their language is closest to Tamil. Uh, also Muslims in Kerala uh, sometimes refer to their language in Tamil, by the way. So we're talking about the 13th century, uh, more or less, in which Malayalam has Avne and uh, no longer Avanike. So we can say that those uh, Jewish and Muslim Malayalam speakers probably uh, classed, kind of uh, crystallized as communities, uh, speaking communities at around that period. And this goes very nicely with the inscriptional evidence that we have for both in Arabic and in Hebrew. Uh, another archaic feature is obsolete lexemes that are very interesting and very challenging as well. Uh, in the language documentation project, and apologize for those that I uh, told them that I am not transcribing according to the phonetic script. Yeah, I should have uh, bothered uh, more about this. Here I am using the index script. Uh, there is this interesting term, mayi beracha. So mayi beracha, what you see in the image is a, is a havdala uh, glass brought from India, uh, from uh, Malabar, India. Uh, by the migrants of the 1950s and kind of keeping it at home. So I took an image. Mai uh, Baracha means Havdala uh, wine. When I first heard the term, Bracha, of course, is clearly the Hebrew term for blessing, Bracha. But what is Mai? I asked them. They didn't have any answer. At first, I thought maybe it's also a Hebrew term, but no. I had to dig into a lot of uh, lexicons and dictionaries to finally find that there was this root or verb in old Malayala, mai, that ran obsolete, that meant to darken. Today, and also in uh, texts later than the 13th century, you have irul used uh, in the same meaning. So irutu will, will be uh, dark. Mayi as a, a word for dusk, for dark, for that time in the day in which uh, darkness start creeping in, uh, is, is not used in the new Malayalam. Uh, another term for uh, dusk or for that special time of the day is Sandhya um, in Sanskrit, alone or in Sanskrit. And here it is important again to uh, relate to the period in which Brahminic Sanskrit becomes a more uh, influencing, a more influential on Malayalam language. So again, we're talking about the 12th, 13th centuries. Uh, another interesting term is Shirya Divasam. 
Shirya Devasam, again, I had to really uh, break my head. The first encounter with this term is uh, about this interesting object. I'm sorry for the image. I couldn't get a better image of uh, that uh, Torah scroll wrapped in black, uh, which is called, that's what the speakers told me in, in my language documentation project, Shirya Muta, Uncle Shirya which the mothers you used to tell them if you don't you know, eat your food or if you behave in a too naughty manner, Shiria uncle will come and beat you up. Uh, so I asked, what is this Shiria? They said, this is the, the term of this Torah scroll during Tisha B'Av, but later on, I heard from other speakers that Shiria Divasam means a night of Ab. Uh, and again, I was thinking, what is this Shiria? Where does it come from? Uh, I finally again found it in a Tamil lexicon, Chir, which means destroy, actually in old Tamil. And it is combined here with Divasam, which is a Sanskrit term. So perhaps the combination changed over time. I am not sure about it. Uh, but today in Malayalam and in Jewish Malayalam, if you want to say destroy, you use the term Ari, including the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. So here we have a compound that means the day of destruction, Yom HaChurban, which is another Hebrew term for ninth of Ab. And here again, we have to uh, go back to the 13th or 14th centuries to uh, understand when this term was coined. And if this, both of these terms might have coined either a little bit earlier. Why? Because these two are the oldest uh, Jewish Malayalam terms for ritual for a reason. You see, you have to imagine uh, the seasonality of the monsoon and also Indian Ocean trade. When a Jewish trader, uh, let's say in the 11th century or the 12th century, and we have evidence for Jewish traders actually living in the Malabar coast for a, a decade or so, or even more, um, and having families there uh, when they, and even if not, right, even if they are just traveling uh, for a few months, still they have to spend a few good Saturdays there, right? And they need to perform this uh, Havdalah uh, ritual. And we do have evidence in the Geniza for traders uh, in the Malabar coast asking for raisins, uh, wheat and paper to be sent to them from Aden for doing those mitzvahs. They used to do even until the 20th century raising wine in Malabar for the Kiddush and Havdalah. Why? Because of course, grapes are not growing in India. Uh, and Tisha B'Av is especially interesting because if you look at the patterns of the monsoon winds, the way to Kerala is in the period between April, here it says April, September, but it should be April until June. June is when the monsoon starts and nobody travels during the monsoon season. It is too dangerous. And the way back is between November and February when the monsoon winds uh, blow southwards. So if a trader reaches the Malabar coast in that season between April and June, he has to spend that period until November on the Malabar coast. And that is the period of, of course, Tisha B'Av and also the high holidays. Okay, migrated regionalism. So that's another topic uh, I would like to cover. Uh, and it's also important historically. Uh, in Jewish Malayalam notebooks, in the songs, there is this very strange uh, exchange between the palato alveolar liquid ra, which is a very typical sound in Malayalam language that no other communities, uh, no, not in Tamil and not in Karnataka, uh, pronounce it uh, any longer. Uh, so this ra uh, is replaced by da, ta or da in Jewish Malayalam. Uh, I don't want to bore you with too many phonetic details, uh, but just a few examples and also a little bit of the, the digging I did. Uh, I was wondering where does it come from? And apparently this is typical of the Tia caste, the Tia speech, 
uh, of northernmost Malabar in that region. Perhaps you remember, this is the region where Malayalam and Tulu uh, intermingle and where speakers of Malayalam speak a language that most Malayalam speakers find very difficult to understand. And this is also the same region in which we have a lot of Geniza records uh, about contacts with the port town of that northernmost region of the Malabar coast. So in Jewish Malayalam, they have, uh, for example, uh, the verb var, to, which in Malayalam means to prosper or to rule, to govern. And in Jewish Malayalam, it is pronounced vada, and it means be blessed, okay? Uh, the reason I pronounce this ta is da, I didn't think I should act, but now I realize I should say a few words about that, nevertheless, is because uh, stops in Malayalam, consonants in Malayalam, uh, there are no voiced stops, not only in Malayalam, in all the Indian languages. So, t, is an allophone of the, and similarly, k and g, okay? That's why I pronounce this vat as, va, as vada. Uh, vadavu is the equivalent of bracha, of blessing, um, in Jewish Malayalam. And no other Malayalam speakers, except for this Tia community, pronounce it, uh, pronounce varve, uh, prosper and rule uh, in this way. So uh, I thought, okay, now we have an interesting uh, case for exploring the possibility that this community, right, migrated regionalism means that there was a community of Jewish Malayalam speakers that migrated from that northern region. And indeed, and this is surprising, there is a place called Madai in which the local population, which is uh, over 60% Muslims, uh, remember an old Jewish settlement by referring to this strange looking pond as the Jewish pond, Judah Kulam. Judah means Jew. Uh, and again, if we go back to the Geniza records, one of the industries that the Jews, Jewish traders were involved with was iron. This red stone was very important for the bronze industry. It's rich with iron. So we might have a, have a good case to argue that there was a Jewish community in Madai and there are a Mal Jewish Malayalam speakers in Israel today whose family name is Madai, meaning that they still retain their place of origin in their uh, family names. So this is the region. And then uh, we can speculate also based on comparative analysis of their old literature, old Mal Jewish Malayalam literature, that the Jews Jewish communities emerged there between uh, the 1100s and the 1400s. But there are no more. There are some foreign travelogues talking about Jews in Madai uh, in the sixth, early 16th century, but probably they migrated even before that, before the 16th century, to central Kerala, to Kochi. A synagogue is constructed in Kochi in 1489. Uh, by a Castilian Jew, by the way. So by the 16th century, we already have two synagogues uh, in that port town and a mosque and a temple, uh, it grows. So this migrated uh, uh, or displaced uh, dialectal uh, uh, pronunciation of Ra, later on is corrected and hyper-corrected. You can imagine that people feel embarrassed, right? People laugh at them at the way they pronounce this Ra. Uh, so you can see the hypercorrections in, for example, verbatim translations printed in Kochi in the late uh, 19th century, where Urikunu is used to translate the Hebrew Zoreach, uh, shining. Uh, and once you start digging in the records, you can't understand where they took this term from unless you go back to Udikunu, which means to shine. Okay, so this is a hypercorrection. Uh, or uh, in the language documentation project, I interviewed a woman who told me a story, Kara, 
Uh, and I immediately, now I was wiser, I immediately realized that actually she's hypercorrecting Kada to Kara. And so we can say that between the late 19th century and even as, as late as the early 21st century, the process of correcting and hypercorrecting this migrated regional uh, feature was still uh, going on. And I know that they continued uh, pronouncing uh, Ra as Da because uh, an Ornagulam a Malayalam teacher uh, told me he remembers how everybody used to joke uh, um, uh, about the way that Jewish women say, I had uh, lunch. They used to say, he told me, Bakshanam Kadichu, and he laughed a lot, right? Uh, so the let's say with you know, double commas, the correct pronunciation is of course Karichu. And his memories go back to the 1940s. Okay, the Hebrew component. I hope I'm not taking too much time. Oh gosh, I forgot to put the stopwatch. So the Hebrew component, and uh, this is an image from Tekumbalam Kochi Synagogue, uh, more or less in the 1950s. Uh, the Hebrew component uh, is used with auxiliary verbs. There are different types of Hebrew components uh, incorporated into, uh, integrated into Malayalam. Uh, and I'm just giving examples of those that were used before the migration to Israel. So for example, Shalom Ai, Shalom means became Shalom, that is died. Uh, and Ai is the verb to become. Uh, and we can again compare it to uh, Muslim Malayalam with uh, Mayat Ai became dead, uh, which is a loan word from Arabic, Mayat, the participle uh, noun. We have Sara Petu, uh, fell in trouble. So Peduga, the verb Peduga can also be used to uh, compound uh, verbs based on um, uh, loan words. Sara is from the Hebrew Tsara fell in trouble, and we can compare it to a similar uh, compound with the Sanskrit loan word kashtam, kashtapetu. This is how Malayalis would say uh, fell in trouble or uh, experienced difficulty. Uh, and another interesting term is with the verb kuduga, minyan uh, kutale. This is the way that they refer to bar mitzvah. Minyan is the Hebrew term minyan, and here it is combined with kutal, a, a verbal noun from the root kuduga to join. This verb kude is traditionally uh, used when uh, they talk about joining a religion or joining a religious uh, path in Kerala. And for Jewish Malayalam literature, and with this I am nearing the end, so I hope you can bear with me. Uh, so this relates to other distinctive uh, features. And this is one of the most prominent uh, things uh, preserved in this uh, unique language. We have biblical songs that I think were composed in that northern uh, area of Madai that I talked about, from which the uh, displaced uh, dialectalism, this, this uh, migrated regional uh, feature migrated to central Kerala. Uh, these songs probably were composed in the mid to the late 15th century. Uh, biblical songs with uh, uh, midrashic allusions and other juicy stuff, very interesting. And then we have another set of biblical songs, probably composed because they cease to understand what those old songs um, mean uh, in the, I estimate the period of, of composition between the uh, 1600s and 1700s. So this is, you could say, new Jewish Malayalam. Uh, we have other genres of different sorts of wedding songs and parrot songs and so forth. And we have another interesting genre of translation songs in which they adapt into Malayalam uh, Hebrew piyutim and even a little bit of Aramaic piyutim. Uh, so you can even have a little bit of clue about the, the depths of their erudition in the Hebrew and Aramaic and the Jewish uh, literature. Uh, and we have verbatim translations uh, that were used orally, uh, mainly orally, and I also estimate the period of their composition between uh, the 18, early 18th century and uh, late uh, 20th century. 
So let us take a listen to a little bit of verbatim translations. This is Esther Abraham in Nevatim. I found it in YouTube when I did my project, I was recording only audio. And she's uh, demonstrating how uh, they used to translate the uh, Passover Haggadah, okay? So let's take a listen. What she does, she's holding the Haggadah in Hebrew, but the translation she recites is from her memory because she doesn't have it written in Malayalam before her. <laughs> Okay, I'll stop it here. Uh, you probably don't really manage to differentiate between what is Hebrew and what is Malayalam because of course her pronunciation of Hebrew uh, is uh, already Malayalamized, but once you, you get your ear trained, you can differentiate. So it's a phrase in Hebrew and a phrase in Malayalam, a very interesting translation with some very old uh, Malayalam forms. Okay. And now we're going to, I'm going to play, you know, this is a, a long video and I would highly recommend if, if I'm, I'm going to send the presentation uh, uh, after uh, the session. Uh, it's a long video, but it's a, a real find, a seminar on Jewish Malayalam song from the Library of Congress in 2008, where uh, Galia Haku and Venus Lane, uh, Galia Haku is the organizer of the Jewish Malayalam singing groups of women in Israel, and very much uh, the living uh, spirit behind the revival uh, movement of the songs in Jewish Malayalam. And Venus Lane uh, is one of the singers and a very uh, lovely lady. So I would like you to hear them sing and also talk a little bit about how they uh, try to preserve their linguistic and literary heritage. And Skaria Sakaria, who uh, passed away a few months ago and he was my Malayalam teacher and was very exciting for me to find this video and see him speak about the Jewish Malayalam song. So let us take a listen uh, a little bit. Sande Tiruvelat, Hodu Varga Nina Perio. This is the synagogue song, Kali Pata. Hodu Varga Nina Perio, Tanil, Boda de Livuda Tambirane, O Mana Pali Il Nuscari Pan, Ulilunar Vuda Tambirane. So, Pali Nuskaripan means uh, let us pray in the Pali. Nuskaripan is another, Nuskarikuga is another verb that is common to Jewish Malayalam and Muslim Malayalam. Uh, other communities don't use it for uh, denoting prayer. This is Barbara Johnson uh, who collected those songs for many years. And now let us take a listen to a few seconds of Galia talking about her project. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean that. <laughs> we don't have that time to wait until learning Malayalam. So we decided to um, release, prepare and release a video, a, a CD. But the main work was put not only in the singing that we know already, that is our summing up work, but this we want and we, we dedicate it to our second and third, third generation because it is transcribed in, in uh, transliteration in Hebrew letters with dots so that they can pronounce the words in Malayalam with two sentences of the, the, what it is about. We so I wanted you to see this because interestingly, it is only in Israel that they started writing <laughs> Jewish Malayalam in the Hebrew script. And this is a very interesting development. And also we can reflect a little bit about it, right? Why did they write for centuries their Jewish Malayalam in the Malayalam script? They didn't feel the need to develop a Hebrew a transcription of Malayalam until they migrated and lost touch with the language. 
And I also would like you to hear what Venus has to say. I think it's really important when we think about the Jewish languages in general and the situation of Jewish languages today in a very authentic and candid uh, way. So Galia has said already a lot of things, so I won't be <laughs> saying too much. Anyway, I was born in a family of singers. Like they said, my great grandmother, Docho, my great great auntie Dolly Jaffet uh, and their sisters and on and on. They were all experts in these uh, Jewish Malayalam songs. But when I grew up, I learned a lot of wedding songs and, and festival songs from my community, the only community left at that time where I lived. When I migrated to Israel in 1972, I was very disappointed to see that all the communities came in 1950s and later on no one was singing these songs anymore. It looked like a past, their past history. But to my nice surprise, on my wedding night, in the marriage hall, a few women, including my family, the late Ruby Daniel and her sister, all my aunties and all the Jewish communities sitting together and began to sing these wedding songs. For a minute, I was shocked. And to tell you the truth, a little bit embarrassed why I suddenly thought, oh my God, hearing these songs in this language and this peculiar tune, what my Israeli friends and colleagues will think. Such a language, such a music. Uh, although I knew the Israelis loved me very much and still they love, and they love all the Indians. They have a very good name. They, they like them very much. But still, uh, I felt a little bit ashamed which I should not have. Now I am very sorry about that. But what to do? We were, <laughs> all new <laughs> we were all newcomers to the country. Everything new, the people, the language, the different cultures. We were actually trying to adjust to the new life and uh, to be one of them, thinking that that is the best thing we should do for our future. Now, after so many years, I think what a wonderful and thoughtful decision I made to join the Nirith group and, and uh, bringing all these precious songs from these books alive once again. It's thanks to Galia, I am proud of her. Mm. Once these Jews had body. <laughs> Don't be under the impression they were spiritual beings only praying, always thinking about going back to Jerusalem. No, no, no. They had all mundane affairs. They thought about marriage, they thought about conjugal love. We have wonderful songs about it in it. That too coming from centuries back, you know. I'm sure they are not going to sing that. <laughs> but you must know there are songs, they are worth exploring, but I'm not going to that right at this moment. Let me come back to the historical songs. The body is important, that's what I am trying to say. This is called the parrot song. The parrot is there at the cover of this. You see this parrot. This also has a history. This parrot's figure is taken from a marriage certificate made in Cochin about 150 years back, but brought to Israel, now being displayed in the Israel Museum. One can see that. What is this parrot song? For this, we need an introduction. As Smitha did, I will let me say it as an Indian context. In India, whenever you want an authoritative text to be introduced, like Mahabharata or Ramayana, they introduce a parrot. Parrot is to mediate this legend, great legend. So also, the Jews thought their historical legend must come as a parrot song. So first of all, they invite the parrot, please come. I shall provide you milk. I shall provide you fruits. Please sing our song. That's how the song begins. OK. And lastly, you can, again, uh, I highly recommend that you listen to this lovely lecture. And just one minute with the third generation uh, that are currently uh, looking for, there is a hole for all of us who migrated from uh, our grandfathers and fathers migrated from Asia 
there is a hole, you know, we don't know the language of our grandparents and our communities, our material heritage, the landscape, we, most of us can't even go there. In the case of Cochini Jules, they can go there. So in Kerala, there are, there is a revival and nostalgic revival of Jewish history. So they started preserving synagogues that, uh, in this case, this is Chenomangalam synagogue, where we saw evidence for a very old community. So you can see the bits and pieces of what used to be the inner furnishings of the synagogue. They try to preserve it, they make a museum out of it. And uh, in Israel, uh, there's a lovely artist that I also work with, Meidad Eliyahu, who is reflecting that kind of bits and pieces of their old material heritage in his art. And he's presenting in the Kochi Binale. So just one, uh, in one minute how he and a Muslim calligrapher who knows Hebrew uh, did this project in the Kochi Binale. And it, with that, we will finish. <laughs> It's all about being public with the subject of memory and the cultural dialogue Jewish had here in Kerala. The lines are from the Jewish Malayalam songs that they are writing, inscribing, and of course the parrot. This was what is left from the Kadul Bagam synagogue of the 15th century. Tell the story through art, which is made by Medad, and the calligraphy by myself, which include English, Hebrew, and Malayalam. This project have a lot of, I won't say responsibility, but commitment to, to the history. I also feel that sometimes I, I need to bring my, in many cases in this project, I need to bring, bring my own perspective.